It's very appropriate uh, that I introduce Gene Heyman, in a way, uh, because the two of us have had very similar research histories, uh, parallel but uh, separated by some years. I won't say which of us is older. Uh, I think you'll be able to figure that out for yourself. Uh, we were both uh, grad students at Harvard, both worked with uh, Dick Hernstein, uh, both uh, did experiments uh, uh, relating to the matching law. Uh, and to jump ahead a little, uh, I gave a talk on the matching law just like this uh, a couple of years ago, uh, one of these tutorials. Uh, in between times, uh, Gene has uh, uh, drifted more in the, in the direction of uh, psychopharmacological research, but he's always had his hand uh, in the matching law and its, and its problems, and also in problems of uh, uh, self-control and an addiction, and I've drifted more in the direction of economics, but I've always had my hand in self-control and also uh, in addiction. Um, recently, uh, his work, uh, he's done some work on uh, alcoholism and uh, developed a method for, for measuring individual differences uh, in alcohol's capacity uh, to control behavior. Uh, by means of uh, economic uh, measurements, uh, measurements of, uh, uh, of demand and uh, elasticity. Uh, and he's also uh, done uh, some beautiful studies uh, on self-control, uh, which uh, I think, I hope, we'll hear a little bit about uh, today, uh, in which he is able, uh, by uh, virtually switching a signal on and off uh, to change an animal from an animal that behaves impulsively uh, to an animal uh, that behaves with a degree of self-control. Uh, so he can turn them on and he can turn them off. Um, uh, today uh, he's going to uh, uh, give this tutorial about the matching law uh, from basics to contemporary paradigms, the matching law, Gene Haven. I want to tell, um, discuss today is really the relationship between the matching law and, uh, I'd say, an attitude in uh, economics, or especially microeconomics. And it has to do with the relationship between what at least economists mean by rationality and uh, what our experiments are telling us. Uh, are those two uh, actually the same? See, the title is a selective outline of the longstanding debate on whether the matching law stands as a violation or confirmation of economic rationality. And how I will proceed is in the following overhead. Uh, these are what I hope to get through. I'll uh, begin with a uh, uh, description of the economic approach, taking it from a textbook example. Then I'll show you um, what we find in the experiments, and we'll discover uh, that there is an apparent conflict between uh, what the uh, in subjects are showing us and what the predictions were, if we believe the economists. But there's a resolution, and the resolu resolution has to do with how we measure reinforcement. Uh, and uh, if we identify the proper dimension of reinforcement, we uh, can uh, bring rationality and the results of our experiments uh, uh, together. So that then raises the next level. Uh, the next question is, what are the uh, uh, determinants of the effective dimensions of reinforcement? And I'm sure there are many. Uh, what I'm going to describe are uh, a couple of experiments at the end where stimulus conditions determine which dimension of reinforcement is a uh, uh, controlling choice. Now, can you see the overheads in the back? Can you see the bottom? OK. Um, fine. So the story I want to tell you problem is how um, what economists tell us should happen uh, uh, articulates with what our experiments say. Now, uh, let's, I want to begin with um, a kind of uh, example that you would find if you read uh, any textbook in microeconomics uh, that talks, has a chapter on consumer demand. It would be organized around the following sort of problem. Uh, imagine 
you have $100 to spend every day. Uh, you can spend it on two commodities. You can spend it on, let's say, food or recreation. How should you spend your $100 each day? Uh, there is a general principle that you'll find. Uh, I just chose uh, a particular book um, here. Uh, Ed Edwin Mansfield, uh, uh, author of 25 textbooks in uh, economics. This is what he says to do, and you'll find this uh, in any, uh, it's, not, it's not unusual. Uh, consumers are assumed to be rational in the sense that they choose the market basket or more generally, the course of action that is most to their liking. Consumers cannot choose whatever market basket they please. Instead, they must maximize their utility uh, subject to constraints of price and uh, income. Okay, so we need to know, understand two things uh, before we can proceed. We want to understand what is utility, what, is, what do they mean by utility, and most importantly, what do they mean by uh, market basket here? We can show that in two figures. Uh, this I'll uh, go through quickly. Uh, this is what they mean by utility. Uh, here we have um, money spent on these two activities, food and recreation. Uh, each of these activities uh, produces a certain uh, state of satisfaction, and that's what they mean by utility. The point is that um, the um, what is being maximized is subjective. Uh, and how do we uh, understand what it is? How do we know what it is? Well, we know what it is from people's uh, preferences. So what pe actually what they mean by utility is very similar, if not identical, to how uh, I'll be using the term reinforcement. Uh, we know what reinforcement is from uh, behavior. So utility is just simply the subjective effect of engaging in these various activities. And this is a, uh, a reasonable relationship that we can expect. Uh, now, uh, I took these uh, curves and uh, tried, to, and we found the maximum, and we'll see that in the next graph. And the next graph is also going to tell us what they mean by market basket, and that's the most important idea here. On the horizontal axis are what uh, Mansfield means by market baskets. They're combinations of the two activities. Uh, Twenty. Uh, like 20% means that 20% of the money is spent on food and 80% is spent on recreation. 80% here means that 80% is spent on uh, food and 20% on recreation. Uh, the point is that what the uh, individual is doing is comparing these different combinations, uh, food, different combinations of food and recreation. On the y-axis is utility. These, this figure was uh, derived from the other one. And we can see that where what the subject is supposed, what the individual, the consumer is supposed to do, is land at the maximum, which would be this particular distribution of 60 percent of the uh, income spent on food. Now, the point, one of the points uh, that uh, economists make, and I think that should be clear, is that uh, this is an irresistible conclusion. It doesn't make any sense for the consumer to spend, let's say, 40% of his income on food, because just by spending, redistributing it, they can get a lot more utility. Uh, in fact, if they, the consumer says that, uh, uh, that they're not going to spend 60% on uh, food, they're going to uh, disprove the economist, show their independence, or be perverse, we could actually make up a utility for being perverse or being independent and show that they were maximizing. So that we, we have to end up at that maximum. So we see that, uh, to summarize what economists are about, we can go to the most widely selling textbook, uh, Samuelson. And he summarizes that the, the, the position I'm just trying, I'm trying to get across uh, as follows. The view that consumers maximize utility is not merely a law of economics. It is a law of logic itself. So that is economics. And now what I want to do is describe some experimental data. And what we'll want to see is if the experimental data conform to these statements. 
Um, the, the experimental literature, I'm going to take this a small slice of the experimental literature on choice. I'm going to look at concurrent uh, schedules and uh, concurrent interval schedules. We'll look at a concurrent interval ratio schedule. Um, this is a, a useful exercise because the results are very uh, reliable and very general. Okay, uh, this is the results from uh, a, a set of experiments. Uh, the subjects were humans, rats, pigeons. Uh, this is probably a familiar graph to you, but let me go through it. On the horizontal axis is uh, the proportion of reinforcements on one of the keys. Oh, let me step back a minute, and I probably should describe the procedure, uh, the basic procedure here, um, because some of us may not uh, be familiar with it. Uh, this is these these data are from a concurrent uh, interval interval procedure. Basically, the subject chooses between two interval schedules of reinforcement. Uh, how they work is as follows: There's in an uh, apparatus there might be two manipulandums. Um, associated with each manipulandum would be a timer. Uh, when a timer is running, a response at its manipulandum doesn't have any effect. When the timer elapses, when the interval in the timer elapses, the next response produces a reinforcer. Uh, they're both running, um, and uh, the list of intervals, there's, they're loaded with a list of intervals, a distribution of intervals. These intervals have a mean, a mean time at which they elapse or run out, uh, which interval is in the timer uh, is unpredictable, so you don't know exactly when it will run out, you just know that it runs out at a particular rate or average. Uh, and the two timers frequently uh, are run at different rates. If you want a, uh, uh, an analogy uh, in the situation, it's be like being at Las Vegas, uh, you're playing two slot machines, except that the slot machines pay off according to the passage of time. Uh, not according to the probability or the rate at which you pull the lever, but uh, they pay off according to the passage of time uh, with the jackpots, and one might pay off at a higher rate than the other. Okay, so that's the setup here, and we'll come back to that. Um, the distribution of reinforcers, which uh, the experimenter arranges by uh, manipulating the timers, is on the uh, x-axis. The distribution of responses is on the y-axis. That diagonal line uh, shows you where the points would lie if there was a perfect fit between the allocation of behavior or choice proportions and reinforcement proportions. And um, I'm showing and the results lie fairly close to that line. And this is a, a highly uh, uh, general finding. We see it in a, a wide array uh, of situations. Um, and it is called. Uh, because of its generality, the matching law. And let me make a few points about it. Where, we just, uh, where we're headed, we want to know if this matching law is what the economists predict, but let me tell you a few things about it so that you can appreciate uh, the finding. Uh, one thing that needs to be pointed out is that it didn't have to work out this way. That is, the response proportions don't have to equal the reinforcement proportions, and why do I say that? Um, the timers, uh, the reinforcement propor proportions are pretty much fixed by the experimenter when he uh, sets the timers. The uh, ratio of responses to uh, reinforcers is usually quite large, on the order of 30 to 1, 100 to 1, so that for a given reinforcement proportion, there is a wide range of response proportions which can occur. So that line did not have to be at a 45, uh, did not have to be a diagonal, it could have been horizontal. That would have been possible, that is a possible outcome. Another way of saying it is that the uh, that relationship we saw in that graph is not something that reflects the procedure or the equipment, but is saying something about the individuals, the subjects in those experiments. Uh, because of the generality and reliability of the relationship, we can write an equation. Uh, we can do the data justice by writing an equation, and the equation uh, is usually written in terms of responses, which is the first equation, where B1 refers to responses at alternative 1, and B2 responses at alternative 2, and R's to the reinforcers. Or 
uh, we find matching if you measured the amount of time they spend at each of the schedules. This third point, uh, we can ignore for the moment. Okay. So what do we have? We have two results. We have what the economists say should happen, and we have what we observe in experiments, and it's general enough so we can take it as a, uh, a general finding. And really what we want to know is if are they really the same. And it's not obvious because uh, in that graph that I just showed you, uh, what we saw on the x-axis was response proportions, and what we saw on the y-axis, I mean, the x-axis was reinforcement proportions, what was on the y-axis was uh, response proportions, and what the uh, economists were looking at were, was utility. And uh, how do we get from one to the other? Well, what Mansfield was talking about, and what economists are talking about, is that consumers choose the combination of goods that produce the uh, greatest amount of uh, satisfaction. Uh, what com what, uh, so it's the combination of, let's say, food and recreation. What conforms to that? Uh, what is consistent with that? Well, what's consistent with that is really the left and right reinforcers. Uh, in these situations, one thing as we pointed out, the reinforcers are typically the same. Uh, at each alternative, so it's not like food and recreation, but it's food coming at two different rates or recreation coming at two different rates. So if the, if the subjects are maximizing uh, market baskets, uh, that would be equivalent to maximizing overall reinforcement rate. The combination, where we were t before talking about food, and uh, recreation, now we're going to be talking about left and right reinforcers taken together. And what we should expect is that if we have procedures where the relationship between the overall reinforcement rate, the combination of left and right reinforcers, and choice vary, if there's some constraint such that in one procedure you can get the greatest overall reinforcement rate by responding more on the right side, and in other, you can get the most by responding on the left side, we should see variation in behavior. And uh, we don't, the, the, match, the choice proportion doesn't have to be exactly the one that produces the highest overall reinforcement rate. It just has to co-vary. There may be factors such as response cost, uh, uh, other activities that uh, deflect the choice proportion from the point that maximizes reinforcement rate. What we care about is just, is there a systematic relationship between overall reinforcement rate and choice? And it's like saying, is there a systematic relationship between uh, the distribution of, of market baskets and choice. It's the same kind of question. So how to proceed? Um, we can look at a long series of, of different choice procedures and see if there's variation between the overall reinforcement rate and uh, choice proportions. I think I can make the argument with just uh, looking at two um, procedures, two schedules. One will be the familiar concurrent interval schedule where there's two interval schedules presented. And then I'll look at the ratio interval schedule. And what we're concerned about is the relationship uh, between overall reinforcement rate and uh, choice at this stage. And what I'm going to show you now are some analytical results Uh, this is based on um, a model of um, this concurrent schedule behavior that uh, actually I initially developed in my thesis uh, and then uh, was published in a series of papers with uh, Duncan Luce and uh, Dick Kernstein. Um, and what the model does is relate choice proportions to uh, overall reinforcement rate which is the variable we're interested in. We want to see if those two things go together. First, we want to see what they should look like if the uh, uh, individuals are maximizing. Uh, 
the, there are really two uh, assumptions that led to this uh, graph. One is that um, the subject uh, has a constant probability of switching from one key or one alternative to the other, and that probability is constant or stationary through time, uh, a Poisson process. And the other assumption is that uh, the schedule set up reinforcers also according to Poisson processes. And uh, actually, this, we, d we designed the schedule so they actually do that. And um, I, uh, early on, I thought you had to uh, try and um, base your uh, assumptions on actual data. And so I tested the Poisson model, and uh, it actually does uh, work fairly uh, well. Um, so there, those are the only two assumptions, and it leads to this relationship. And on the, uh, this is a typical schedule, 30-second uh, um, timer uh, on one side, 90-second on the other, meaning it every about uh, two reinforcers a minute on one side and um, uh, two-thirds on the other. Uh, so what do we get? Uh, on the x-axis is uh, choice proportions. On the y-axis is um, uh, reinforcers per hour, overall reinforcement rate, or in the language of economics, what, we were, what they meant by market baskets. Uh, what I've pointed out uh, here on uh, these points up there show you, uh, if you go down, this is the choice proportion that would produce the maximum reinforcement rate, and this is the choice proportion that would produce matching. And we see that they're virtually identical. So that matching and what the economists say should happen look like that is what is going on. Uh, they're not quite identical, but they're very, very close. You couldn't tell them apart in an experiment. However, what we also see is that there's a wide range of uh, choice proportions that produce nearly maximal reinforcement rates here, which suggests, well, maybe uh, uh, overall reinforcement rate doesn't have much to do with behavior because we don't see a widespread of behavior of choice proportions. We get matching in these situations. So let's look at another procedure. And really, we don't care if they're identically the same. We just care about uh, uh, covariation. Let's look at the uh, interval ratio uh, procedure. And here, I'm going to describe uh, results from an, ex uh, an analysis and results from uh, two experiments that were published uh, by myself and Dick Kernstein. Uh, and in the interval ratio procedure, it works something like this. At one alternative, there's the interval schedule that sets up according to the passage of time. And at the other alternative, there's the ratio schedule, which sets up probabilistically. Every response has a certain probability of being reinforced. Um, so on one, work matters. Uh, the rate of reinforcement will depend on how fast you work. And on the other, time matters, um, in the sense that uh, it, the passage of time determines when a reinforcement occurs. Um, so if you are, again, if you're thinking about a Las Vegas analogy, if you're at Las Vegas, one slot machine pays off according to the passage of time. The other slot machine pays off according to how fast uh, you play it. And I think if you think about this, uh, we can kind of imagine what would be the optimal, a uh, good strategy. Uh, if one is paying off according to the passage of time and the timer is running when you're not there, uh, you can just kind of wait for it to uh, elapse and then go over and visit it and spend most of your time on the ratio schedule working and getting reinforcement. So under most conditions, we, might ex we would expect uh, uh, subjects who were uh, paying attention to overall reinforcement rate to spend most of their time on the ratio schedule, and every once in a while go visit the interval schedule and see if a reward has set up. And when you do, here, uh, here I've uh, analyzed uh, what uh, re overall reinforcement rate on a situation where the interval schedule uh, elapses on average every 30 seconds. 
And the ratio schedule takes about 30, res uh, 30 responses on average to produce a reinforcer. So interval 30, those are the parameters. And I've plugged in parameters, uh, behavioral parameters that came from the experiments. On the uh, horizontal axis, again, we have uh, choice proportions, but here uh, graphed in terms of the interval schedule. So over here means they spend 100% of their time on the interval schedule. Here means they spend 10% of their time on the interval schedule. And on the uh, vertical axis is overall reinforcement rate. And we see that the maximum, as we would uh, intuition suggests, uh, occurs um, by spending about 10% of your time on the uh, interval schedule and most of the time on the ratio schedule. Um, working away, getting reinforcements, and every once in a while checking the interval schedule. And here I've also shown what you would do in this procedure if you were matching. Um, so this is a situation in where we can pull apart matching and maximizing overall reinforcement rate. Also, uh, it should ask uh, what um, it should be. You know, what distribution of behavior is the worst uh, in terms of um, overall reinforcement rate? And it actually turns out that the distribution of behavior that's worst if you spend all of your time on the interval schedule. So, what do subjects do under this, these conditions? And I'm going to show it in two ways. I'm going to first show it as a kind of a histogram where on the x-axis is uh, choice proportions uh, in terms of the interval schedule. And on the y-axis is the number of subjects who chose, ended up at that particular choice proportion. And uh, this is, um, I think there are uh, four subjects and about six conditions. And we see that the most popular, the most popular choice proportion is spending 100% of your time on the interval schedule. We see that virtually all the subjects spent most of their time on the interval schedule, um, which is not what you would expect uh, from overall reinforcement rate if that was influencing choice. But it is what you would expect if they were uh, matching. And indeed, that's what they were doing. Uh, this is a, a, a graph of uh, in slightly different coordinates. It doesn't. The diagonal line is again the matching line here. They're graphed in log coordinates. Uh, the data uh, fall uh, are in a systematic way with the uh, dashed diagonal line, which is the matching line. Okay. So. Uh, here we have um, uh, a, a quandary. We have uh, what we ex we know what we should expect to happen, uh, according to economic theory, and we also know that it makes eminent sense. Uh, it doesn't make sense for an individual to choose less uh, uh, rather than more. That just does is not reasonable. However, we've looked at the matching law. Uh, we see that it occurs, uh, it's a very reliable result, and we can see that we can arrange situations where matching uh, leads to a lower overall rate of reinforcement, which is the uh, quantity that uh, is said uh, to be controlling preference, or the quantity rather that is maximized, uh, and we see that they are different from one another. How can, this, how can we get this reliable result, which doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense for them really to take uh, less uh, when they could get more. And uh, issues having to do with uh, whether or not they experience the higher reinforcement rates, we, we tried to take care of that by starting them off in some of these experimental conditions where they're at the maximum. Uh, and then they gradually drift uh, down uh, to matching. So what to do? Um, the solution to the problem uh, has to do with how we measure reinforcement, or what the effective dimension of reinforcement is in these situations. There, is a, there are a variety of ways we have, uh, people have looked at reinforcement. Um, the probability, the moment to moment probability of reinforcement. Uh, we just saw what happens when we looked at overall rate of reinforcement. Uh, 
And uh, another measure which has been uh, talked about more recently, and it's the one that turns out is going to be most helpful, uh, a measure called the local rate of reinforcement. These are three different ways of talking about reinforcement or three different dimensions of reinforcement, three different ways of measuring reinforcement. And they turn out, it turns out to make a big difference uh, uh, which uh, dimension uh, we're looking at when uh, we're trying to bring the data together with what we should expect to happen uh, according to basically reason itself. So what I'm going to do now is describe what we mean by local reinforcement rate and show how that makes sense of the data. And then uh, we're going to move to the question of uh, what determines which aspect of reinforcement, which dimension of reinforcement is influencing the behavior. What do we mean by local rate of reinforcement? Uh, the concept is, is uh, simple. The, the top two uh, top uh, lines give what we mean by local rate of reinforcement. It's simply the rate of reinforcement that occurs when you're at a particular alternative. Uh, in contrast, when we talk about overall reinforcement rate, we really mean the sum of the reinforcers R1 plus R2 over T1 plus T2. Or a pen. Um, okay. Uh, this is the denominator here is just the amount of time you spend at a particular alternative. So what we were talking about before, oh, this won't work. Oh. Really, what we're talking about before is this term. That was the economist's intuition and many people's intuition about what should be controlling choice. Uh, now let's look at a more molecular or myopic view, uh, just the rate of reinforcement while you're at an act, doing an activity. And I want to point out something. Uh, if this is what we mean by local rate of reinforcement, it turns out that when the local rates of reinforcement, let's just assume there are two alternatives, when the local rates of reinforcement are equal, it turns out that that is the same as matching. So that suggests that there may be an intimate relationship between this local reinforcement rate measure and matching. That matching is indistinguishable, logically indistinguishable from the statement that local rates of reinforcement are equal. So now, let's look at the interval ratio situation in terms of these new measures, local rates of reinforcement, and see if it becomes more sensible. I'll first describe how local rate of reinforcement works at the ratio schedule, then the interval schedule. Okay, the horizontal axis, the x-axis here, um, we're looking at, I'm just going to step back, an interval ratio procedure. Uh, what the horizontal axis here, here is the amount of time that you've been on the ratio side uh, since you just got there, assuming that you're switching back and forth. This is a very molecular uh, a graph of just a little period of time that starts when you've just arrived on the ratio schedule. It doesn't matter when in the session it occurs, but you've just changed over from the interval to the ratio schedule, and this shows how much time you've stayed there before leaving. And on the y-axis is the uh, local rate of reinforcement, and we can see that it's constant. Why is it constant? Well, I'm assuming, and this is a fairly reasonable assumption, that the rate of responding while at the ratio schedule is very steady, stable. Um, if the rate of responding is stable, the probability, it's also the case that the probability that each response is reinforced is fixed, the constant. So if we multiply a constant rate of responding times a constant probability of being reinforced, reinforced we get a, a constant rate of reinforcement. So that is a constant. Now, let's look at local rate of reinforcement on the interval schedule. And here, it's a much more complicated picture. <coughs> and this, this is the most complicated uh, graph we'll be looking at. 
Okay, the, the horizontal axis is the same as before, except from the perspective of the interval schedule. Um, it's um, looking at um, time spent on the interval schedule, given that you've just arrived there, again, at any point in the session. So you're switching back and forth between the ratio and interval schedule. You land on the interval schedule, and a clock starts ticking. And it keeps ticking as long as you're there. Uh, the y-axis is the um, local rate of reinforcement, and we can see that it's a very dynamic situation, and that they're changing. And they're changing for two reasons. Uh, let me explain the first reason, which has to do with how long you've been away from the schedule. In other words, how long you've been on the ratio schedule. And that is shown by these different symbols. Let's take uh, the, the filled triangle indicates that you've been gone for 30 seconds. And again, we're assuming this is an interval, 30-second interval schedule. You've been gone for 30 seconds from the interval schedule. Uh, the interval schedule is running away, running on when you're gone. And while you're gone, it could set up a reinforcer. Hence, the longer you're gone, the more likely a reinforcer has set up. Okay, exactly. So you stay away a long time. And it's, if you stay away for a couple of days, you know, when you come back, there'll be a reinforcer waiting for you. Uh, here's uh, someone who just stayed away for 30 seconds. And since we uh, have an equation that's very close to what we actually, uh, the, how the schedule works, we can actually calculate what that probability should be. So on the x-axis is this local reinforcement rate is calculated for every second you're there. So for the first second you're there, it's the rate of reinforcement that occurs in that one second period. That's what we're looking at turns out that if you're gone for 30 seconds, there's about a 0.63 probability that the reinforcer has set up. Timer has elapsed while you're gone. So for that, that first second, the probability that a reinforcer occurs is about 0.63. Uh, and uh, so if you multiply uh, that out, uh, there's 60 seconds in a minute, we get a little over 40, we get close to 40 reinforcers a minute is the rate during that first second. If you just look at that first second. Then the subject waits another second. Um, the probability that the timer has set up in that second second is now just 1 over 30, the VI interval. And so if we look at the rate of reinforcement, given that you've been there for two seconds, it's going to decrease because we have the rate for that first second, which is 40 a minute. The rate for the second uh, second is going to be, it's going to set up with a problem, is really going to be close to two a minute. So we're going to divide 2 now into uh, 40 plus 2. And so the local rate of reinforcement plummets. You stay there longer, and as you're staying there longer and longer, the local rate of reinforcement is decreasing. And why is it decreasing? Because the benefits of that, uh, the time we're setting up are being diluted. And, they're being, and now the rate of reinforcement gradually, if you, stay, if you stay there for an infinite amount of time, it would approach the programmed rate, which is two a minute. Uh, this line is uh, if you've been away for 15 seconds, so the probability is not quite oops, getting pulled back. Uh, probability is not quite as high, and but they all are going to converge at two a minute, which is the programmed rate. So local rate of reinforcement is uh, very dynamic. Uh, the longer you're away, which is a way of saying the less time you spend on the interval schedule, the higher it is. Uh, but the longer you stay, the lower it is. But it, although it's high, you don't get to get it very often. So there's this kind of tension uh, between local rate of reinforcement and how long you stay at the schedule. It's somewhat counterintuitive uh, in that the longer you stay, the less that it is. That, that seems. On the other hand, if we think of it uh, as a kind of a diminishing returns, it's not so unreasonable. Uh, what it's saying is the longer you're doing something, the less good it is. So it's really a rather common situation. So what happens when we put these two together? The ratio local rate and the interval local rate. And remember that when the local rates are equal, we have matching. This graph is a generalization of the other one. It's based on the same assumptions uh, that uh, what, the, what the x-axis really stands for two things. Uh, it stands for the, the rates or the probability of which that's switching back and forth and also the choice proportion.
When it's 10%, it means that, uh, 10%, uh, that there was nine times more likely to switch to the ratio schedule than the interval schedule, which produces an overall distribution of time 10% on the interval schedule. When it's 50%, it means that the probabilities of switching to the interval schedule and the ratio schedule were exactly the same, which will produce an overall distribution of time of 50%, and so forth. At 90%, it means that he was nine times more likely to switch the interval schedule than the ratio schedule each moment. Uh, and these are the local rates that you would experience if you had distributed your time in the way shown on the horizontal axis. And what we're trying to uh, make sense of is why do the subjects end up at matching? Okay, imagine. Imagine that you're a subject and you're paying, and now instead of your utility coming from what the economists call market baskets, it comes from the local rates of reinforcement. So that local rates of reinforcement are the sources of utility. That is the rate at each alternative taken separately. Uh, let's say you're spending 30% of your time on the interval schedule. Let's look at your local rate of reinforcement. It's much higher on, it's higher on the interval schedule than the ratio schedule. And it's higher for the reasons that we explained before. So what should you do? Well, if uh, uh, preference is based on local rates, you should spend more time on the interval schedule. What will that do? That will drive down the local rate, diminishing returns. Uh, drive down, you'll keep spending more time on the one that has the higher local rate. Uh, you might even keep doing it, uh, go, you keep experimenting going down here, and you'll discover if you switch back and forth once in a while that the local rate at the ratio schedule is higher. So that should drive you back to the ratio schedule. And you, we can see that uh, this process will kind of come into equilibrium when the two local rates are the same. But remember, when the two local rates are the same, we get matching. So what is the story here? Uh, we can bring uh, the economic framework and uh, our outcomes, our behavior that we observe in experiments uh, together if, instead of assuming that utility is uh, based on the, uh, some overall measure of reinforcement, we assume that it is based on this local measure of reinforcement. Uh, the subjects are, are acting as if they're choosing what is best, but it's the local rate of reinforcement, and they end up at matching. Hernstein and Vaughn um, uh, developed this idea of the uh, local rates of reinforcement controlling behavior, and as you may know, they call that process uh, amelioration. But what I just want to quickly point out before I go to the next how much, section um, is that um, local rate uh, maximizing is different than overall reinforcement rate maximizing. This is where they end up by paying attention to the local rates of reinforcement. This is where they would have ended up in this procedure if they had paid attention to the overall rates of reinforcement. So um, there's a difference. Let me now go back to uh, the beginning of this talk and uh, ask, uh, we have basically a disagreement about which dimension of reinforcement or which dimension of utility should count. Uh, economists' intuition was that it was the overall rates and uh, the experimental subjects are telling us that it's the local rates. Uh, why this difference? I mean, they're both, in a sense, they're both behaviors. What the economists are doing uh, is behavior. Why do they come to a different conclusion? Uh, there's probably lots of reasons uh, why that is so. Uh, uh, economists are, 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 are smarter than pigeons. They're probably smarter than people. Um, <laughs> um, but... And there's, and there's probably other reasons. And the reason that I have uh, wanted to look at, because I can do experiments, uh, has to do with the stimulus conditions. Uh, it's not clear. Well, it's, you do economics in your office, um, and uh, you're not in a choice situation. Uh, 
and whatever the stimuli are, are they, what they seem to elicit is the idea that uh, you're going to come up with a very clever answer and also an answer uh, which uh, is, uh, in a sense, optimal. It tells people what is the best thing to do. What you're not confronting are the options themselves. Uh, you're not engaged in the option when you're doing economics. Uh, when we do our experiments, and I would also uh, uh, say when we're engaged in for the business of life itself, uh, the stimuli uh, are associated with what, we were, what I was defined as the local rate of reinforcement. In the experimental chamber, we have a left light, and we have a right light, we have, and sometimes they're red and sometimes they're green, and they're associated with the local rates of reinforcement. Importantly, there is no stimulus for the overall rate of reinforcement. Uh, if we go back to this graph, no one has published a paper, I'm actually doing an experiment, uh, in which there is a stimulus which corresponds to that line, the overall reinforcement line. This is an abstraction. The stimuli correspond to the left and the right keys. There's nothing here. So the question, uh, if you think about you know, what is determining economics, the behavior of economists, and what is determining the behavior in, uh, in these uh, experiments, and you want a coherent account, we can say, well, maybe it's the stimulus conditions are determining what are the dimensions of reinforcement. So what would happen if uh, we added a stimulus associated with the overall rate of reinforcement into these procedures. Uh, this is what Howie was referring to when turning the uh, uh, subjects on and off. Uh, basically, we're asking the question, can we turn them into economists uh, by adding a stimulus that corresponds to uh, the market basket or overall reinforcement rate? And let me describe uh, this procedure. Uh, it's, some, it's an experiment which is in, in process uh, but uh, most of the data are available. Uh, the procedure works like this. Uh, there are three keys. Uh, two keys on the front wall of the chamber and one key on the back wall of the chamber. On the front wall of the chamber, there is a reinforcement. Uh, there are two timers, two, it's a, and there are variable interval timers associated with each key. Uh, there's a four to one ratio, uh, t one timer times out four times more frequently than the other on the front wall. And then the timer, there's a timer on the back wall uh, which is in between those two. So it's a re it's so far it's just like a concurrent schedule except that there are three keys. And now we add the following rule. We say that if uh, choice proportions on the front wall uh, deviate from matching, the subject will get a higher overall reinforcement rate. Let me say that again. We have a, and we fix, let me just say that we fix the uh, reinforcement proportions at four to one. So as the subject moves away from a four to one allocation of behavior, reinforcement rate will increase. And that is arranged by the computer. Uh, so 80% is the uh, uh, exact matching. Uh, we, we measure this over a sample, let's say the just previous 80 responses. So we say if the uh, subjects, just previous 80 responses were 40 and 40, it would get a much higher reinforcement uh, rate than if they were like um, you know, s uh, 70 and 10, something like that. As they move away from matching, they get a higher overall reinforcement rate. And second, we turn on a light uh, we turn on the, uh, uh, we change the house light color uh, when the subject is deviated from matching uh, far enough to meet the criterion to get this higher reinforcement rate. So the, there's a stimulus associated with differences in overall reinforcement rate. The relative rates go up and down together on the front wall. There's always four to one, but it could be um, 40 and 10 reinforcers in a session, or four and one reinforcers in a session. When it's 40 and 10, the subjects were not distributing their behavior according to matching. And a light went on to tell them what they were doing. So what do we get? And remember, there's, a, uh, there's this key on the third wall. First, let me describe baseline conditions to you. This is a busy graph. Uh, let me. First, let's just look at uh, the baseline, which is this 
set of data. There are three keys, so we have three, uh, three uh, responses to look at. Uh, on the x-axis is the uh, distribution of reinforcers at each of the key. On the y-axis is the distribution of responses. The open symbols give the front wall uh, response proportions. The filled symbol gives the back wall response proportion. Uh, this is baseline. There's no punishment for matching in baseline. This is, this is just a regular VI schedule, except we have three keys instead of two. Uh, now, we put into effect the contingency, which says that if those two uh, open symbols fall on that diagonal line, you're going to get a lower rate of reinforcement. That is now going into effect. We see that they move away from the diagonal line. And in this particular case, there was a 80 uh, response window and a 20% penalty zone, meaning that uh, the birds uh, had to deviate uh, from matching. There was sort of 16, 16 response range with which uh, matching was, uh, responding was sort of in a sense punished by lower reinforcement rates. So the just, okay, now we increase, just to make sure we know what we're doing, we increase the uh, requirement. We make it a larger penalty zone. They have to be now very, very far from matching uh, in order to get reinforcements. And we see even larger deviations. In fact, we see a reversal where this left key was uh, in the initially lower uh, response proportion. Now it's a higher response proportion. Basically, the subjects are at 50-50 on those two front keys, even though it's a 4 to 1 reinforcement proportion. What's happening at the back key? Okay, this is uh, baseline again. Back key, it's the same baseline. Throughout, on the back key, that back key where there wasn't a punishment, uh, it is stayed on the diagonal line. You can also may notice that the, re the reinforcement proportion has shifted because the rates of reinforcement on the front wall are getting lower. But the back wall responding is uh, corresponding to uh, matching. So what is going on here? Is that, is that result clear? Are there questions about? The back key gives reinforcers actually on a VI 25 second schedule. So there are three ske VI schedules, the VI, I think, 12, VI 52, and a VI 25. And the back key was a VI 25. So it's, yeah. Excuse me? No, it can get re it, uh, there's no contingency for that back key. The back key is just like a regular VI key. Okay, conclusions. First, I'll give them for this experiment, then overall. Uh, front wall deviations from matching indicate that the cues uh, uh, influence behavior. Uh, when the cues uh, signaled the overall reinforcement rate, behavior became under the control of overall reinforcement rate on the front keys. However, the same alternative can fit more than one frame of reference. Uh, left and right keys responding deviated from matching, assuming the context of front wall, left versus right. That's what those open symbols showed you, deviations from matching on the front wall. However, if we look at, uh, instead of, uh, if we look at left and right responding as a single unit and looked at back wall versus front wall responding, there was matching. So in the broader context of the two walls, or the chamber, that's really the way to put it, in the chamber there was matching, and the front wall there wasn't. And what determined it was the stimulus conditions. And the front wall overall reinforcement rate in terms of the front wall was controlling behavior. Uh, there were no stimulus conditions corresponding to overall reinforcement rate for the chamber as a whole. It was just front wall versus back wall. And there we get uh, matching again. So. Uh, conclusions. Uh, individuals behave as if they choose what is best, as we had uh, learned from economics, and as I think reason itself tells us must occur. However, what is best depends on the effective dimension of reinforcement. Uh, stimulus conditions are one of the factors that determine the effective dimension of uh, reinforcement. Um, another way, I guess, of saying this is that the uh, 
choice is uh, rational. However, the frame of reference may not be optimal. That would be one way of uh, summarizing all, all of this. So that we see that um, really what matters in all these things and something that has been ignored is how the uh, situation is framed and uh, or what are the, another way of saying, what are the effective measures of reinforcement? Thank you.